Hi there, I'm Dr. Ben Britton, and as I have recently moved to the University of British Columbia, I would like to acknowledge that I'm recording from the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Within this talk, I'm going to present some of our work uh, using a data science method to characterize fine scale features using correlative methods and a few other tricks, tips and tricks. Within this, uh, it's going to be presenting Tom McLeese's work. Uh, he's a, a recently graduated PhD student that links heavily and builds upon Alex Fonan's PhD. Again, a graduate student who's just completed. Uh, he developed the pattern matching method. Uh, and then a number of others, including Chris Wilson, Ruth Birch, Tibor Desolier, uh, Daphne uh, Daskalihi uh, Montagnu, David Dye, uh, and myself. So why do we bother with these methods? Well, materials characterization, and if we render this as a data-led method, we uh, can use the data to try and enhance the statistics or counting statistics. And the question we can use is, can we therefore amplify the signal from difficult to find features? Within this approach, it's important to consider and design the statistical or machine learning or data science method, however you want to flavor it, to be suitable for the target application. And so you should ideally have some good questions to build upon here. Within this work, I'm going to show some phase identification and chemical analysis of precipitates in uh, polycrystal superalloys. And then I'm going to show you how we can very clearly show and analyze diffraction patterns from gamma and gamma prime cobalt superalloys. So if we take conventional approaches and we do simultaneous EDS and EBSD, we can see that the uh, classification of different phases that you can clearly see in this image quality map are not identified as the correct crystal structures and the chemical signatures are rather fuzzy or blurry uh, and therefore quantitative analysis is quite difficult. So how can we improve this? Well, we can consider that the energy dispersive spectroscopy technique, fundamentally it has typically a larger interaction volume, although that's of course chemically sensitive, it's generally produced by electron scattering and then promotion of the core electron falling back down and the generation of the characteristic X-ray. This X-ray, of course, must escape the sample. This creates the characteristic X-rays ahead of the Bremsstrahlung. And this is a relatively, well, you get relatively strong contrast if the phase changes, often because the chemical speciation according to each phase will vary significantly. Within a phase, however, you may have small gradients uh, associated with, say, chemical coring of your precipitate or dendrite, perhaps. It's actually a relatively sparse data space because there's a relatively few number of peaks that are present above the Bremsstrahlung itself. For electron backscatter diffraction, we have a relatively smaller interaction volume. It's formed due, due to electron, uh, small amounts of near uh, elastic electron scattering. Uh, and then those electrons can effectively bounce off the lattice, uh, diffract and produce our beautiful diffraction patterns. And there is strong contrast when the phase changes because the crystal structure can give rise to a very different diffraction pattern. And there is also relatively strong contrast if there is rotation within the same phase. Of course, the patterns that we often see are sort of background corrected. And when we're doing some of these uh, data science based approaches, we have to be careful with that normalization. And there's a lot of sort of skill or art into that process itself. So if we look at the method that we've developed, and this is from Tom McClue's work, we start off with by measurement at multiple points, a characteristic diffraction pattern and energy dispersive spectra. We then can construct what we call the data matrix, where each column corresponds to a single point in our map. And then we match the EBSD pattern wrapped into a vector and the EDS pattern on the bottom, the spectra on the bottom. And so effectively each column is one point and each row is one detector element either within our CCD or one particular energy bin within our EDS. What we then have to do is effectively a weighting structure to balance the information that's produced from the EBSD and the EDS to enable us to effectively select out appropriate, say, principal components. We then use a method that was developed by Angus Wilkinson and colleagues, the very max rotation, to enable us to create effectively similar variance physical data for each point. And this enables us to label the scan points with each of those rotated components. 
Once we've done that, we can then choose how we classify those components. And often we'll do that through EBSD based pattern matching. But once we've classified them to different phases, we can then look at the chemical variation of those components. We can look at the classified structure or phases and we can uh, extract out the chemical, uh, the crystallographic orientations. We can then say cluster and look at the different MC precipitates. And we could say, what is the mean of those uh, chemistries? Uh, and we can look at the characteristic peaks from a quant of say the sum of all the physical diffraction, uh, all the physical spectra that are produced. To do this, we use the principal component approach. Uh, and so this effectively is where we take our diffraction pattern, we turn this into a single vector. And then in a principal component approach, effectively you create a series of principal components that describe strong variations in your map. Each component goes onto a score map, which is the spatial distribution of how those components map into the physical data. If you have one score that's very high compared to the rest, then this sort of characteristic principal component diffraction pattern would correspond to that domain as described by the spatial map. In the uh, multivariate statistics approach, we effectively take the top n principal components, we rotate them to therefore go from having a change of variance for those uh, principal components to a near uniform variance between the components i.e. the physical similar symbols are physical signals are very similar. This was developed, as I say, by Angus Wilkinson and colleagues. We can then use EBSD based template matching and we use the approach in Astro EBSD as developed by Foden et al. Uh, and we can label each of those characteristic diffraction patterns uh, as per orientations and or crystal phases. So this is just one example where we take a, a deformed steel sample Here's our label map with each individual characteristic uh, diffraction pattern. If we then do the pattern matching, we can reconstruct the inverse pole figure map where each of these domains has a single label of a single orientation and crystal structure for that point. When we link the energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, we simply add this to the bottom of the EBSD uh, diffraction pattern vector. And we have to introduce a weighting factor that basically says how much balance or how much strength will you play to the EBSP versus how much contribution will you have of the EDS. This is important to tune because effectively there is a statistical difference between these two uh, data types and there is of course the physical variation. If you weight heavily to EDS often you may have less variation between your crystal phases uh, and uh, crystal domains um, and you'll have relatively large interaction volumes. If you weight too heavily towards the EBSP, then effectively you don't let the chemical signature tell you about differences, say, between similar crystal structures, but different crystal phases. To tune this, we effectively will run, and there's a semi-physical approach to doing this, as described in Tom's paper, but in this method, Effectively, this is the weighting components of how much EBSD signal to use versus EDS signal. The top, this is weighted EDS focus. And then this effectively is saying how much, how many uh, characteristic signals are we allowed to use? Uh, and so this is more characteristic signals. And so it looks noisier, although of course you just are, are labeling this afterwards. So although these may have two different labels as shown here, when you then measure them by matching them to crystal patterns, they may come out as the same orientation or crystal structure. What you're looking for is sort of a sweet spot and there's a statistical approach as described in Tom's work that effectively enables us to get out that the phases are uniquely described even when there are two very similar, as shown here for these two domains, crystal structures that are connected. Uh, and this is a decomposing carbide after some thermomechanical treatment. So if we do this correctly, we can see that the conventional method is significantly improved, that the label data gives us not only the crystallographic orientation map, but also well-described crystal phases. And we can extract out effectively each of these domains to give us these sort of radar plots of the chemical variation between those different species. Uh, this we, we've done and shown the method, 
but there's also some, some uh, newer work, it's on the archive and in Tom's work, that effectively applies this. Uh, and this is the only way that we can be used, uh, used to develop actually a whole new alloy system uh, of cobalt nickel based superalloys. If we take this one step sort of further and we think, you know, what else could we use these data science and, and data rich methods uh, to do? Well, what we could do is we could consider situations where effectively that clustering of signal to noise can uh, enable us to resolve very subtle differences between our diffraction patterns. So if we consider within the nickel cobalt system, we have the gamma gamma prime structures. So effectively we have the gamma structure, which has a disordered FCC like structure. The uh, gamma prime has an L12 structure, which is kind of like the FCC structure, except that there are specific atoms. So it's uh, nickel three aluminium. And so nickel, I think fits hits on the uh, vertex corners. Uh, oh, I've got it the way around. Uh, nickel sits in the face centers and aluminium sits on the corners. This uh, crystal structure, many of you know, is really important for the strength of these systems. But one of the important details for controlling effectively creep uh, combined with, uh, say, fatigue strength and a few other bits and pieces is to control the distribution of primary, secondary and tertiary gamma prime, i.e. the size, shape and distribution of these precipitates. Revealing these in conventional methods requires very careful etching and very careful calibrations to extract the volume fraction. And so the question we wanted to ask is, could we image just simply using the diffraction-based method uh, and clustering them here? If we just look at a conventional EBSD map of a small subdomain that we know contains multiple gamma and gamma prime, we see that actually conventional Huff-based approach, of course, does not show strong variations. You can sort of see the sort of mod modulation that's broadly in here, but it's not obvious about the size of those domains. If we look at dynamical calculations as shown as stereographic projections of the dynamical pattern between nickel and nickel three aluminium, we see that there's very, very subtle variations uh, in the spherical radon transform. We can see that those subtle variations are, are characteristic on particular crystal plane projections. Uh, each of these circles corresponds to one of the bands uh, in this diffraction pattern. So there are no, unlike in a TEM, for instance, there are no systematic band absences, the super lattice reflectors and, and those sort of bits and pieces. Instead, the, the variations are much more subtle in the EBSD geometry and the Kikuchi bands. Nevertheless, if we do some data clustering methods, so we can use the PCA method, or we can use a very similar approach called the non-negative matrix, matrix factorization, which is uh, often preferred for physical signals. Um, and there's another method that we use, which is called the autoencoder, where you effectively take an input, you create an encoder to describe the input, uh, and then you can uh, reconstruct an output using a decoder. Getting this tuned correctly can enable you to split out signals quite nicely. So if we look at the principal component analysis results, the top, say, five components start to show you very significant variations in the spatial maps, the scores of those components. We see specific bands and structures that are appearing throughout our microstructure. This is very similarly seen, although of course the rotation of the components is subtly different. But for instance, we see beautifully the sort of island structure coming out in factor three of the NMF. In the autoencoder neural network, uh, similarly, we get that beautiful structure reproduced very strongly in latent one. Um, and we can see that effectively we can then image by looking at say specific components or specific segmentations, we can extract the uh, gamma gamma prime structure quite nicely from our diffraction based information. But if we take and we know that there are specific crystal planes, what we can do is we can imagine effectively extracting the particular bands out from the diffraction pattern and do band profile analysis on those particular crystal planes. Uh, very fortunately, we've done uh, some collaboration with Ralph Heichler and colleagues to uh, create the sort of spherical radon transform uh, and uh, effectively we can do band extraction from that mathematics. That enables us to directly extract the band profiles from the spherical projections. So this is the sum across the entire of the band, summed across all of the families uh, that are present. But we can now sum and we can look at the differences between effectively the gamma and gamma prime ascribed experimental patterns and the simulated uh, cobalt nickel and cobalt three aluminium tungsten. That's effectively similarly our gamma gamma prime. 
And you can see sort of the Bragg angle is somewhere around here, but you can see there are very subtle fluctuations where there are stronger and weaker variations depending on the crystal planes that are being imaged. This can be seen if we effectively sum in between the Bragg peaks, these little circles on these profiles, and we can start to see if we sum the intensity between the Bragg peaks for the different crystal planes. We can see, for instance, that there is reasonably strong contrast for the 100, the 110, the 111, but there is relatively low contrast for the sum of the 131 type crystal planes. Uh, with that, I'd like to summarize to say uh, we've hopefully shown that we can directly connect EDS and EDSD data. We can label based upon these information. We've got to consider what data is similar and dissimilar, both from a statistical and physical based approach, uh, and 